so it's just yeah, there. just an arrow, I assume. Okay. Yeah. So it's Wes, me, you, back to Wes. This is open session. Okay. And then we got um, lapel mics for when we do this sit down. Okay. So you just do down arrow and it oh, goes. Down arrow. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to be doing right now. And then you advance the screen with this one, but I can advance it in the back if you want. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Nichols is going to go after me. And I think we'll all s they'll be sitting up here. Dr. Nichols got a lot of slides. She doesn't talk much, so her slides move fast. All right, right on time, almost. Good morning, welcome to BG. Thank you for being here. What a great turnout. This is the 2024 BGSU Public and Allied Health Symposium. This is the 24th edition, uh, bigger and better each year. This year's topic is about the uh, an unfortunate incident in East Palestine. Uh, going back over a little over a year now. Um, so we have guests from East Columbia, uh, Columbia County Health District to talk about that and the response to the train derailment. And we have uh, Thomas Lindsay with us from the state of Washington, environmental lawyer, talking about uh, what we can do maybe to get more active in our communities and try to prevent these things in the future. Um, so just some housekeeping issues I'd like to address here. 11 to 12 is the keynote with Thomas Lindsay, then we'll have lunch at, at noon. The box lunches are back at the back table. There is a color code scheme. It's the most complicated part of the, of the day. We'll be able to figure this out though. I'll, I'll be back to tell you which, which color goes with which type of a lunch. Um, and then we'll have the Columbiana County team come back and we'll do a, a panel presentation and then have some Q&A session at 1.30. So again, thanks for being here. Bathrooms are located right out the door Take a right, and then right there, there is a um, unisex bathroom all the way below this room. So you go out the doors and go down the stairs and then go to the right. And then you can have a, a unisex bathroom there. Um, we will record this event and post it on the Baker website. So you can um, refer to that in the future. And then continuing education credits are available, but you have to fill out this, the final evaluation. So there is an exam today. You're in school again. Sorry, we have to have the evaluation filled out and then that will be your link to your continuing education units. Thanks to the planning committee, Carol and Amanda and Sharon and Wen and Bradley and Damalola, thank you very much. Thanks to the catering people, the event staff, the AV techs and our band, our music was awesome. Those are BGSU music students. Um, so thanks to them for everything. I'd like to bring to the the stage, our uh, Dean of the College of Health and Human Services, Jim Ciesla, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, the Ned Baker lecture, and, um, and then he'll introduce our President Rogers. So please welcome Dean Ciesla. Thanks, Phil, for all the work that goes into this. I, um, a couple things. 
first off, welcome. We're very glad to see you here. You know, there's an African proverb, very wise, and if you don't mind me bending it into submission a little bit, it takes a village. We can't educate our students and do what we do at BGSU without all these connections. You being here is uh, evidence that those connections are active and well and in place, and we're very grateful for all that you do for, for us. And of course, we see ourselves very much as part of that community, the village, as educators and researchers. So thank you so much for being here. And then second, a little history, and then I wanna um, make an announcement. Um, so this is our 24th year of doing this. In 1999, um, the Cove Charitable Trust rep, uh, to recognize the career-long excellence of Ned Baker formed an endowment here at BGSU. That endowment has been funding this lecture for all these years. It has a caveat, and this year's a crossroads. Um, it also now provides for a professorship, Ned E. Banker Distinguished Professorship in Public Health. I won't have to introduce the holder of the professorship because he was just here, but please help me um, congratulate Dr. Welch as our first Ned E. Baker Distinguished Professor in Public Health. Lots on the agenda today, so I won't take any more time, but I do want to introduce the 12th president of BGSU, Dr. Rogers. Dean Cecil, thank you so much, and it's certainly my pleasure to uh, welcome all of our visitors and guests to the 21st, 24th Annual Public and Allied Health Symposium here at Bowling Green State University. Certainly want to acknowledge uh, all of our faculty and staff, Dr. Welch, uh, Professor Welch, Baker, uh, Professor Welch of Public Health. Uh, Phil, thank you. Uh, where did Phil go? He was somewhere, wherever he is. Oh, he's way back in the back. He's doing uh, audio work now. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Welch, for uh, all of your work and your colleagues' work, all of the faculty and staff within our College of Health and Human Services. And Dean Cecil, thank you for your leadership. You know, this year's focus, as you know, is on the public health uh, response to East Palestine uh, train derailment, which was a real tragedy. Uh, of fellow Ohioans over in the northeast part of the state. Uh, but this event each year has brought together professionals, uh, practitioners, and students here at Bowling Green State University, and I know some students from other universities as well have joined us. All across Ohio, professionals coming together, the live stream, I understand we'll have individuals throughout the Midwest that will be here today. But bringing you all together, to talk about various topics of public health. And we are absolutely uh, indebted to Nettie Baker. Um, uh, Dr. Baker uh, was uh, such an important figure, certainly in public health, as you may know. He was certainly a leader and an advocate in public health field. He served our region, of course, but the state and the nation as well. He was a founding member of the National Association of Local Boards of Health and served as its first executive director. And so uh, this is an important event. And I would also be remiss not to continue to acknowledge the incredible work that um, those of you that are practitioners in this field, the professionals in this field, I, I want to make sure you know how appreciative we are of the work you do each and every day for your communities, your immediate communities, uh, for our counties, our, our, our state, and, and the nation. Uh, COVID, we learned a lot of things. We learned the importance of having systems in place where we're helping each other, we're finding a way forward. And, and so whether it is the uh, tragedy of, of um, uh, East Palestine or other kinds of public health and challenges that we have. The work you do, uh, we, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And, and so, yeah, absolutely, a round of applause for all of the work you do. So, as I mentioned, the, the Baker Keynote Speaker Series brings together nationally recognized experts in a variety of different topics, and we are especially pleased uh, to recognize uh, this year's speaker, 
Thomas Allen Lindsay. Uh, Tom Lindsay. He is a senior legal counsel at the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, an organization committed to globally advancing the legal rights of nature and the environment. He is also the co founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and is widely recognized. Uh, as a founder of the contemporary community rights movement, which has resulted in the adoption of a variety, several hundred laws across the US uh, and the world. Um, but I also wanna make sure that I recognize, so certainly uh, uh, a nationally, internationally recognized speaker that we have with us today, the various professionals that are with us today. And I also want to thank our students and other students from other universities that may be here, but the Bowling Green State University students, thank you for being here because you are the future of this profession. You will be leading this profession into the future and you are here engaged. And as a public university for the public good, you know, I wanna make sure that I uh, thank Dr. Baker for his leadership in the past, uh, Tom, thank you for being here, and for all of our practitioners and professionals and our future leaders, thank you all for attending, and I certainly look forward to our keynote address. Thank you so much. Good to be with everybody today. Uh, this is a homecoming of sorts for me to Bowling Green. I uh, went to high school and college about two hours from East Palestine, uh, to the east of East Palestine. It's also a homecoming for me because a lot of our seminal work around community rights, assisting communities to pass laws to make sure that things like the East Palestine a train derailment don't happen again. Uh, happened uh, in Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, back in the early 2000s. So at the outset, I wanted to thank President Rogers uh, today, Dean Cisla, uh, and Ned Baker for making the forum possible. And uh, so when Professor Welch first called me to ask me to keynote uh, this event, I asked him the same question that I ask uh, most of the university folks that extend invites to us, which is, do you have tenure? Because we're going to ask some provocative questions today. And uh, those provocative questions are things that we've tangled with over the past 30 years in terms of community control over things like train derailments and other environmental disasters. So a couple questions at the beginning before we dive in. One is, do communities have the legal authority to ban projects like fracking for natural gas, factory hog farms, or toxic waste landfills? when those projects have been proven to damage public health and the natural environment. Perhaps closer to home, do communities have the legal authority to force railroad corporations to disclose the hazardous materials that they carry and when they are carrying them to enable those communities to be prepared for public health emergencies? At an even more fundamental level, if communities don't want to take the risk of being after the fact of an emergency, do communities have the legal authority to ban the transport of those hazardous materials by rail through the community? And if communities are not recognized under our current system of laws having the legal authority to take those actions, what stops them? Is it the courts? Is it the state legislature? Is it corporations? Is it the law itself? Or is it a combination of all of those? Finally, if that's the case, why do we agree to live under such a system, one in which we're always waiting for something to happen, and then we are the ones responsible for dealing with the aftermath? Which raises an even more fundamental question. Do we actually live in a democracy when community majorities are supposed to be able to make decisions to protect themselves and their families? The air that they breathe, the water that they drink, but for some reason are prohibited from doing so at the community level especially in a state like Ohio, where the state constitution establishes that all political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal protection and benefit, and the people have the right to alter, reform, or abolish the same whenever we deem it to be necessary. That's one of the reasons why we ask professors about whether they have tenure before they ask us to come in to speak. Today, we're going to cover all that. It's usually a three-day training, so we're going to you know, strap in because it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. But 
for the last 30 years we've been tangling with those questions, but we didn't start. I didn't start my law career by tangling with those questions. 30 years ago, I was a law student at Widener University Law School in Pennsylvania. And my second year of law school, we were approached by community groups from across the state of Pennsylvania, some in Ohio, who were looking for legal counsel to assist them with some project that was coming into their community that they didn't want. A factory hog farm, a toxic waste incinerator, some local land use that they didn't want, fracking for natural gas coming to their community. We had to explain to them as that as law students, for us to represent them or to assist them would be illegal because we didn't have our law license yet. But what we did do was we took those community activists and we actually taught them how to use the law library and taught them how to write permit appeals, taught them how to do the things that helicopter lawyers come in, come out, but don't leave a residue of knowledge behind for the community to actually be engaged on those issues. Now, it's not surprising that these communities were reaching out to us as law students uh, to actually do this work for them. It still shocks me, but the numbers are the same today as they were back in the 1990s. There are only 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers in the United States today. 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers in the United States practicing. So, it wasn't, it wasn't unusual that these communities were reaching out to law students to try to assist them because they couldn't find somebody to represent them in their own community. At that point in time, back in the early 1990s, I framed the problem as not the environmental laws themselves in the U.S., which we're told time and time again are the best environmental laws in the world. In fact, they're so good that we export our lawyers to other countries to replicate those environmental laws in those other countries. That the way that we framed the problem at that point was that there wasn't enough enforcement of those laws. There weren't enough lawyers. We don't say that too often, <laughs> but that there weren't enough lawyers doing this work. And so right out of law school, we created, we did something unusual, which was we created a law firm right out of law school to provide free legal services to community groups who were going through these types of issues and couldn't find legal counsel for them. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> they were a bunch of lean years for us, uh, but at one point we were representing about 100 grassroots groups across the state of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, and Virginia doing things like enforcing the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, enforcing regulations and appealing permits. That's what environmental lawyers do uh, most of the time, is that corporation will put in a permit application for a particular project. Environmental lawyers will read the corporate permit application and the permit that's been issued by the state agency, usually the environmental agency for the state. And our job as environmental lawyers is to try to find some kind of mistake that was made in the permit that was issued. Some kind of mistake. Some place where the state agency did something wrong uh, that, or the corporation that was applying for the permit didn't post the right bond or didn't put an updated macroinvertebrate water study in the permit or didn't sign the right page. And that was, that's the work of environmental lawyers today, basically trying to find gaps, omissions, and deficiencies in permit applications filed mostly by corporations to put in particular projects that are approved by the state. And so we were in front of judges quite a bit. We would go in front of judges and we'd say, Your Honor, under section little c, little d, little two, little Roman numeral two, little a, little i, little c, there's a signature missing on page nine. It was supposed to be signed by the president of the corporation, instead it was signed just by the secretary of the corporation. Or there needed to be a million dollar bond and they posted a $500,000 bond. And most of the time the judge would look back at us and say, Mr. Lindsay, you're right. There's something missing from this permit application that was filed and I'm going to overturn the permit. And so at one point we were like 120 and to three in you know, win-loss terms in front of these judges. And we were patting ourselves on the back and we were getting awards uh, from uh, different uh, nonprofit organizations and governments. We got invited to the White House one year. Uh, as one of the best environmental law firms in the nation, we were getting the awards and the accolades, every, everything everybody wants from careers, uh, especially environmental lawyers. But the problem was is that 60 or 90 days after we would win that permit appeal in front of the judge, what would happen next? A corporation would come back and they'd fill in the gap, omission, or deficiency that we had found. 
In fact, after these arguments that we had in front of the judges, I sometimes had the lawyers from the largest law firms helping the largest corporations in the United States come up to me and thank me for finding the gaps, omissions, and deficiencies in the permits, because then they could charge more hours to the corporation to actually fill in those gaps, omissions, and deficiencies that were in the permit. What would happen 60 or 90 days after that? Well, the project would move forward. That's how the law is scripted, scripted to do. And the community group would come back to us and they'd say, Mr. Lindsay, we need you to do that jujitsu that you did the first time around to get this permit application thrown out. And we'd look back at them and we'd say, we're sorry, there's nothing we can do anymore because the gaps, omissions, and deficiencies that we found the first time around, they've been, they've been filled in. There's nothing we can do for you. What would happen 60 or 90 days later? They would get the factory farm. They would get the frack well, right? They would get whatever project they were trying to stop from the community because the community had no power to stop it. In effect, the regulations that they were enforcing against the corporations were written by the very corporations themselves within the regulatory forum. So we went through about 10 years of what I lovingly refer to as Groundhog Day. I don't know if anybody has seen the movie uh, with Bill Murray in it, maybe too young an audience, uh, but uh, Bill Murray ends up living the same day over and over and over and over again. And that was our life pretty much as environmental lawyers, living that same day over and over and over again, trying to find those gaps, emissions, and deficiencies, running to court, winning some early victories, and then having them overturned by having the corporation come in and put that facility or project into the community. In effect, we weren't stopping anything. We were stopping nothing. I talked to some folks, you know, who had done this for 30 or 40 years, because this is burnoutville for the most part, for environmental lawyers. You do this work for 30 years, you don't see any progress, and then people go work at Kinko's. Or I guess Kinko's is not around anymore, it's FedEx Kinko's. <laughs> So in talking with some of these folks that were brighter than I were because they had retired at that point, uh, we found out a lot of things about the regulatory system a lot of people just don't know until they run up against it frontally. One is that the money spent by the corporations, corporate permittees, uh, to actually defend these permit challenges, because at least we thought we were costing the corporations money. They had to hire lawyers, they had to come into the regulatory agency, they had to make the arguments, they had to fight for their permit. What we found out was that the monies that the corporations spend to defend their permits is tax deductible. It's tax deductible as a reasonable and necessary business expense under the tax code. But for the communities who had to pay for photocopies and gas and lawyer fees and all the other stuff, monies weren't tax deductible. Something structural was wrong. Something structural was not correct within that system. And somebody much, much smarter than me said something that sticks with me all the way to today when she said, the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists. That the only thing that the regulations do is regulate how we respond. It's almost a script when something happens or a permit gets issued about how communities are scripted to respond to what's happening that the regulations, in essence, regulate us. But that's not how we think about regulations. We think about regulations as being protective, that somehow they're protecting us from harms. But in effect, the permits legalize harms. They legalize parts per million into waterways. They legalize frack wells. They legalize drilling through aquifers. In some ways, they legalized East Palestine's train derailment, right? Kind of blew our mind at the time, thinking about regulations that way. Someone came up to me at some point and said, you know, it happens all the time. The regulations, they're broken. The regulatory system is broken. It's not protecting us. It's broken. To which we say now, maybe it's not broken. Maybe it's working perfectly. Because maybe its intent is to put us on the defensive. Maybe the intent of regulations written by some of the major industry economic players in the United States who have a seat at the table to develop the regulations, write them exclusively in some ways to make sure that the community can't interfere with what the corporation is doing in the community from a permit or project perspective. 
which makes a lot of sense. If you're at the table and you have the access and you can write the rules, why in the world would you ever give the community any power at all, right? But we are so obedient to the structure, the system that exists, uh, and we look past who's actually writing it. The first regulatory agency in the United States, this may seem dry, but it's really not, the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, was actually set up by the railroad corporations. The same, same railroad corporations, same system of law, same system of regulations operate today in the United States. And there's a great, great quote from the U.S. Attorney General uh, back in 1893. His name was William Olney. And he was having a conversation with the president of the Burlington Railroad uh, in the United States. And this is what Attorney General Olney said. The commission, speaking about the regulatory commission that was set up by the railroad corporations, this Interstate Commerce Commission, the commission is or can be made of great help to the railroads. It satisfied the popular clamor for government supervision of the railroads at the same time that the supervision is entirely nominal. Further, the older such a commission gets to be, the more inclined it will be to take the business and railroad side of things. It thus becomes a sort of barrier between the railroad corporations and the people, and a sort of protection against hasty and crude legislation hostile to the railroad interests. First regulatory agency in the United States, Interstate Commerce Commission, created by the railroad corporations essentially to stabilize prices within the rail industry. Uh, back in the 1990s, somebody also said something that stuck with me till today, which is they're not called permits for nothing. When they're issued, they permit and legalize certain harms. And unfortunately, we're the recipient of those harms in communities. So over 20 years ago, we decided to do something with this knowledge, besides go to work at Kinko's, which was to stop working within the regulatory system. We became some of the only environmental lawyers in the United States to stop doing environmental law <laughs> as, it's, as it's characterized today through that regulatory process. Instead, we began working directly with communities and local governments to do what has become known as rights-based lawmaking. What is rights-based lawmaking? Well, it's using our municipal governments, our cities, our towns, our villages, our townships, our counties, the places where we live, to actually establish and guarantee new human and civil rights. Those rights include the things like rights to clean air and clean water. As stupid as it sounds, there's only a couple communities in the United States where the right to clean air and clean water is a guarantee. And people say, Mr. Lindsay, that's crazy. We have all these environmental laws. We have the Clean Water Act. Of course we have a right to clean water. No, there's no legal right to clean water in the United States. Clean Water Act issues permits for certain projects that emit things into waterways but there's no guarantee that you have a right to clean water in the United States, which sounds insane. It sounds insane that we don't have a legal right to clean water, but we don't. So what other rights did these communities start passing, recognizing? Right to sustainable agriculture, a right to sustainable waste management, a right to be free from toxic trespass, trespass bodily trespass from chemical and hazardous materials, a right to renewable energy, and a right to a sustainable climate. Wow, there's one. A right to a stable, sustainable climate. What does it even mean? Communities began passing these things because they wanted to ban certain projects coming into their communities, like factory farms, toxic waste landfills, fracking, other extraction projects. Pretty soon after we first started working with these communities, there were 100 communities across Pennsylvania and the lawmaking, this community rights stuff, where communities basically gave up hope on the state and federal government. A lot of communities we work with have given up hope that the state and federal government are actually going to help them. They've begun to understand that the only folks that are gonna help them are their neighbors and their friends and people within their own community. That those 100 communities in Pennsylvania eventually spread to 12 other states, including Ohio, where many of these laws have been passed. So again, communities giving up hope that the state and federal government is actually, are actually gonna assist them to stop these projects, and instead creating a community rights movement across the US is what started to take place over the last 20 years. 
whereas communities have given up hope on the state and federal government, the question I have for you is, why have that hope in the first place right now? 40 years after the major environmental laws have been adopted in the United States, by almost every major statistic today, things are in worse shape than they were 40 years ago. I'm going to say it again. 40 years after the major, in some places 50 years, the Clean Water Act uh, turned 50 uh, last year, that 40 years after the major environmental laws in the United States were passed, things are worse today by almost every major environmental statistic that we have. I know you're thinking at this point, I thought you were going to be an optimistic keynote speaker. <laughs> I'll bring all the bad news. Some more bad news. Four billion pounds of toxic chemicals released in the atmosphere annually. 80,000 industrial chemicals in use today. If we tested your bodies, everybody in this room, you'd find upwards of 700 chemicals. 700 synthetic chemicals in your body as a result of that 80,000 industrial chemical stream. Half of all plant and animal species have been driven to extinction. 90% of all original forests have been logged. 40% of waterways still fail to meet minimum clean water standards. And this is 50 years after the Clean Water Act was passed. The ultimate threat to public health, climate change. Even the most pessimistic projections of climatologists right now are looking downright optimistic around climate change. So why is this happening? Why are we in this state 40 years after the major environmental laws were passed? Billions of dollars have, given, have been given to environmental groups across the United States. Billions. It's with a B. Billions of dollars. There are thousands of environmental groups now operating in the United States. Consciousness is now higher than ever around environmental issues. The, the, the question is, what's not working? What are we doing that isn't working? Right? Because I think 40 years ago, environmental activists at least had a very different vantage point that these would work and that we'd be in a much different place now. So a couple other questions. What is it that we don't know when we do the work that we do? And what part of the system doesn't allow for the major shifts that are needed towards actually protecting the public health and the environment? And perhaps in a question that's phrased kind of oddly, why is community protection of public health illegal? Why is it illegal under our system for communities to take steps to protect public health, real steps to protect public health? So back to Pennsylvania and Ohio in the 2000s with this community rights movement, we weren't naive as the lawyers counseling these communities. We knew we were operating in a hostile legal system. We didn't know how hostile this system was to communities that decided to stand up and try to stop these things. But we learned when they were attacked over and over and over again in the same way by the system, mostly by corporations empowered by state governments, sometimes empowered by the federal government, to override communities, to challenge those communities. We came to call them the four horsemen, you know, kind of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, and there were four of them. Most of them are legal theories, uh, most of you have heard of, but clustered together, they actually create a system that prohibits communities from actually stopping that which is harming them. The first of the four horsemen is something called preemption. It's a very dry legal concept, this preemption. But it basically allows the largest economic players in a state to use the state legislature to take power away from localities to actually stop the harms that are occurring in those communities. Ohio is no stranger to preemption. Local gun control measures have been preempted by your state legislature. Bans on predatory lending policies have been banned by your legislature. Bans or regulation of fracking at the local level banned by the state legislature. Bans or regulations of puppy mills. Come on, who can be, a, who can be against puppies, right? Regular puppy mills. Regulation of cell towers, minimum wage laws, paid leave, paid leave laws, plastic bag bans, regulation of pesticides, and even most recently, bans on the sale of flavored tobacco by Columbus and Worthington, cities of. These are areas that the state legislature has withdrawn authority from communities here in Ohio to actually legislate on. And my favorite, there's actually a preemption ban on municipalities that regulate the carrying of knives in public. 
I don't know where the law came from, but it's definitely my favorite. Second of the four horsemen, something called Dillon's Rule. Even if your community is not preempted actively by the state, there's still a question about whether you have the authority to act anyway. It's a flip side of preemption, that you only have the power that the legislature gives to you as a community to actually regulate or control certain things. Third of the four horsemen, corporate rights. It's become a popular issue lately. Corporations have the same rights as you in the United States. Corporations are persons under the law. They have free speech rights. They have due process rights. They have equal protection rights. Corporations as persons can challenge communities who ban certain projects by contending in court that the community has taken their property without paying them. So takings of property without compensation. And perhaps the largest of the four horsemen that ride into battle with communities like East Palestine uh, is doubt in our own heads. So we have three legal theories, and, something that, and then the fourth one is something that exists in our own heads, which is doubt. Doubt that we can make a difference. Doubt that we should be doing anything besides what we're already doing. That we have a role in the defense, that when things happen like a train derailment, that we're acting legitimately when we come in to try to help clean it up that when we're on the defense that we're acting legitimately. But when we act as law adopters, law enforcers, and law makers, that's foreign to us. We don't, know. we don't know what that means. We've been under the thumb for so long, we can't even imagine what it looks like not to be under that thumb. And so the censorship exists in our heads about whether we should be activists or not, reach outside the box, those kinds of things. These preemptive and other horsemen legal doctrines shield some of the biggest industries in the United States from community interference. We perhaps had our most egregious example in Pennsylvania after 100 communities passed laws banning factory farms in their communities, banning corporate factory hog farms. What happened next was that the agribusiness corporations in Pennsylvania got tired of chasing each individual township around in court and instead, they passed a law. They wrote a law, gave it to the legislature. Legislature passed it in 2005. It was called Agriculture, Communities, and Rural Environment. It actually sicked the attorney general's office after municipalities that banned factory farms to sue them in the name of the state using taxpayer monies to do so. So tired of chasing township to township, these municipal governments, renegades, they turned to the legislature, the legislature acquiesced, and actually assigned the attorney general's office to bring lawsuits against municipalities in Pennsylvania who dared to actually protect public health by banning these corporate hog factory farms. The bigger the industry, the more the law protects it from interference. Railroad corporations, coming back to East Palestine, the joke in Pennsylvania is that the, in the early 1900s, it was the railroad corporations that made the legislature run on time. Railroad corporations that made the legislature run on time. The ultimate preemptive law governs railroads, or more importantly, governs communities that are attempting con to control what railroads do. It's the Interstate Commerce Commission Termination Act, or the ICCTA. The ICCTA is federal legislation that preempts all local and state regulation of railroad corporations and rail transportation. You can't touch them under the ICCTA. We learned this intimately in Spokane, Washington, where we have, where I'm from, flew in last night, where we have two dozen trains a week bringing crude oil through the downtown in the city. The bomb blast that would happen if one of those cars went off would take out about half of downtown with an evacuation zone a mile out. When the community asked the city council to consider banning the crude oil cars from traveling through the city, city council wouldn't even consider it. City council said, that's radical, that's crazy, it's outside the box, we can't do it, we'll get sued, the ICCTA says we can't do this, uh, you guys need to go home or call your Congress person and see if you can get changed that way. In response, we filed a federal lawsuit in Spokane, this time against the city council and against the railroad corporations, contending that the ICCTA's preemption provisions violated the right of Spokane residents to govern their own community. 
a concept of a right of local self-government to govern ourselves, to protect ourselves and our families against harm. It was really telling to me, and I've been in court a lot over the past 30 years, to hear Judge Thomas Rice, who's one of the federal judges in Spokane, talk about the city council passing a law dealing with the trains uh, and comparing it to the Boy Scouts Council passing something. That the ICCTA and the system of law that we have around railroads is such to divest so much power from our elected city government that they might as well have been Boy Scouts sitting around in a circle at their council meeting passing something. That was the comparison that he made in federal court that day. So the question we get when we, when we cover these materials for classes and talks is, so what, right? So what? Tell us something we didn't know. We live under a system of law that doesn't actually allow us to protect ourselves at the community level. In doing some research for this talk, your governor, Governor Mike DeWine, even said about East Palestine, no other community should have to go through this, what East Palestine went through, right? Well, the data is that a lot of communities are going through this. Similar chemical spill accidents, at least, from commercial activity, happen once every two days in the United States. Once every two days. So the question is, going back to Governor DeWine, thank you for asking the question, by the way, Governor DeWine, how do we stop it from happening again? How do we stop East Palestine from happening again? That's the question. Should be one of the only questions we're asking, right? Big changes in this country only happen, unfortunately, by force, right? The system changes only by force. Doesn't kind of care whether we ask politely of our elected officials. Doesn't really care about protests. Doesn't really care about signs, caring, those types of things. It only changes by force, and we're reminded of that by the movements that have arisen before us that have actually fundamentally changed the system. Here in Northwestern Ohio, we have the abolitionists uh, who passed personal liberty laws back in the 1860s, which were openly unconstitutional and illegal. We had a Fugitive Slave Act in the United States, which meant that if you assisted a fleeing slave fleeing through Ohio to Canada, that you could be arrested under the Fugitive Slave Act. Instead of backing down, folks in Ohio, folks in other states passed personal liberty laws that defied the Fugitive Slave Act, that said we're going to do what we need to do to protect human dignity and be anti-slavery here. The Underground Railroad, of course, is the epitome of civil disobedience. And there were Underground Railroad stops within 30 miles of Bowling Green. So some glimpses of hope uh, for East Palestine. A lot of people say, well, you know, what you're talking about is communities rising up, kind of a velvet-gloved revolt to push back on this concentration of state and federal authority. And nobody's ever done that before. Well, it's not true. In 2005, the Washington, D.C. City Council passed a Terrorism Prevention and Hazardous Materials Transportation Emergency Act. The act banned hazardous material rail shipments near the Capitol. There's a railway, if anybody's been down to the Capitol in D.C., runs very close to the Capitol. Everybody said, all the important people, all the important lawyers and environmental lawyers and corporate lawyers alike said, we'll never stand up in court. Well, it did. Federal court denied the railroad corporation's attempt to overturn. Railroad corporation then went to the Court of Appeals higher level to try to force the federal court into compliance, the district court. Court of Appeals returned the case to the federal court. Federal court Judge Emmett Sullivan denied the railroad corporations again and held that DC had the authority to pass the law. Court of Appeals eventually overturned it after a very painful series of years in which the federal court was openly on the side of the community trying to stop the hazardous materials from passing through DC. But it illuminated a struggle that began to inform people that kind of we all live in sacrifice zones. We're all in sacrifice zones. So what needs to happen? Well, in our opinion, hundreds of rail communities need to do the same. 
And only two questions are relevant when we're talking about what's going to happen next or if anything happens next. Do we believe that something needs to change? That's the first question. Do we believe that something needs to change? If yes, then what are we prepared to risk to obtain that change? Over the past 30 years, those are the only two questions that we've found that matter. The only two questions that are relevant. Number one, do we believe that something needs to change? And number two, what are we prepared to risk to obtain that change? And we used to end these talks with that nugget, <laughs> which was to say, those are the two questions, go at it. But people came up to us and they said, well, you haven't told us how. You haven't told us what, you haven't told us how. We don't know what to do. Okay, so we're going to tell you what to do. Ohio is lucky. It may not feel that way some days. I know living in Western Pennsylvania, it didn't feel that lucky to be living in Western Pennsylvania, but Ohio is lucky. You have a law that allows the people of cities, villages, and counties to do direct ballot access for laws. A lot of times people say to us, nothing's going to change. Our city council, they love fracking. Our elected officials, they love the railroads. They're not going to do anything. You're probably right. Not because they love the activity that's happening, but because they live in a structure in which they can get sued as a municipal government for violating state preemptive law or federal law. Fortunately for you, you don't have to go through the councils, the elected officials. The law allows you to put stuff on the ballot directly to make law. Collect signatures, put it on the ballot directly. If a majority of people vote it in, it becomes law in the community. Turns out that East Palestine is one of these communities. Section 9.01 of their charter. So uh, municipalities, some have charters, which are basically like their constitutions. East Palestine is one of those. It would only require about 200 signatures to put a law on the ballot. What would that law say? Well, they have to decide how comprehensive they want to be. You could pass a right to know, a community right to know law that would force disclosure of what was being transported and when. And you could, of course, keep that confidential to the city council or just have it turned over to certain folks. People are always quick to say, well, terrorists could get a hold of it, sure. Uh, but there are ways to uh, limit the uh, transmission of that information. Could be a community right to clean air and clean water, a right to be free from toxic trespass. If you want to go any f even further than that, you could ban vinyl chloride or other hazardous materials by tr from traveling by rail through that particular community of East Palestine. You could even do what some communities in Ohio and Pennsylvania have done, including the city of Pittsburgh, which is to pass a rights of nature law. We don't have time to go into those too much, but suffice it to say that communities have been passing laws that establish that ecosystems have certain legal rights. So not just people having rights, but that ecosystems have legal rights, like streams and rivers, things that would be impacted by, I don't know, just pulled out of the air, a train derailment. So build a structure of disincentiveness around the activity itself. And in some places, uh, that has meant rights of nature laws, not just rights for people, but also rights for nature. First rights of nature law was passed in a small community of Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, showing my age, but I wrote that one back in 2006. We were then called in to help write the new Ecuadorian constitution in 2008, which became the first national constitution in the world to actually embed rights of nature into that constitutional construct. In 2010, believe it or not, City Council of Pittsburgh unanimously adopted a rights of nature law to protect the three rivers running through the city of Pittsburgh from fracking. Twelve countries have now adopted these rights of nature laws at different levels and in courts. People may be familiar with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights from 2018 uh, that got struck down in court. There are ways around the federal ruling, so there are ways for other communities to pass similar laws. But this is what it's going to take. It's going to take roles in which we are not comfortable uh, coming together as different communities, in this case across the state of Ohio, to force changes at the state level. What does that mean at the state level? Well, it eventually means changing the Ohio Constitution. 
to embed a right of local self-government into the Ohio Constitution, to allow communities to ad adopt laws more stringent towards the protection of public health and the environment. So not to drop below the floor of state and federal legal protections, but to adopt laws more stringent than those state and legal floors. Again, state and federal law not as a ceiling as it, treat, as it is treated today, but as a floor. And I helped draft the Ohio Community Rights Amendment, which would have done just that in 2017, uh, certified by the Ohio Attorney General and the Ballot Board, would have created a new Article I, Section 22 for the Ohio Constitution, basically guaranteeing this inherent authority for municipalities uh, to pass these laws. Surprisingly, this right of local self-government has existed for about 100 years. Uh, the inherent authority of local governments, in many ways it was the basis of the American Revolution, uh, but for about 100 years, up until 1910, uh, you had Supreme Courts in different states actually upholding this right of local community self-government, a power independent of the state, not needing to be given power by the state, but independent of the state, inherent right of local self-government. We think the path forward is to resuscitate that legal theory and build a movement for local control for enhanced public health and environmental protections. So it sounds so easy, doesn't it? Getting together in our own communities, passing laws, joining hands with other communities, building it upwards through the state. Joining with others to change the DNA of how this place operates and challenge the largest corporations along the way. It's all really, really easy. We should just do it tomorrow. We need to stop being so obedient to a system for which we are invisible. The system treats us as invisible. We're just externalities when things like East Palestine occur. Uh, we've done harder things before. Think uh, hunger strikes of the suffragists fighting for the right to vote. People putting their lives on the line to protect freed slaves. And of course, that Goldie Oldie, the American Revolution, taking on the world's largest army and navy. We seem to have forgotten that heritage along the way. I think we need to pick that right back up. So to, to finish out, I have a quote from a, a guy named Sam Smith. He's an author, author of a book called Why Bother? <laughs> so he wrote a book called Why Bother? Knowing all this stuff, why bother doing anything at all? Let's just go watch some bad television. Uh, and so Sam, in his book, he has this quote. And I'll read it to finish up. He says, yet in a perverse way, our predicament makes life simpler. We have clearly lost what we have lost. We can give up our futile efforts to preserve the illusion and turn our energies instead to the construction of a new time. Politically active Americans have been taught that even at the risk of losing our planet and our democracy, we must go about it all in a rational manner, never raising our voice, never doing the unlikely or trying the improbable, let alone screaming for help. Above all, we must understand that in leaving the toxic ways of the present, we are healing ourselves, our places, and our planet. We rebel not as a last act of desperation, but as a first act of creation. Thank you. research. Oh, thank you. I feel like there's not a lot of research on um, the effects of our bodies, especially like reproductive health and other areas uh, of these toxins and pollutants in the human system. So I think as, um, you know, research universities, that would be great to see more effort put into the research. So then you have more of a standing when you try to push legislation. Yeah, it's a, a good point. There's also something called the precautionary principle, which says let's not wait uh, until we find out the worst of the worst of the 
condition that can be caused by certain materials. And plus, I have to say, kind of the cynical side of me, I've been waiting 40 years for some research to be done, and a lot of it's corporate funded. And so it's not something I count on, and a lot of the public health and environmental research that needs to be done is not being funded because it's not fundable. It's not fundable by the corporate boys, so we're in that situation too. I think uh, one of the difficulties uh, with any issue is that people focus on a particular uh, source and they would like to regulate that source rather than all sources of, of certain things. How do you address that? Yeah, it's a, great, uh, it's a great comment. I think that in the US today, at least from our experience, the only place where community rights activism is happening is when people are faced with an imminent harm of some kind. And when that imminent harm comes in, there's a tendency to strike back at the source of that harm. I think a lot of our job as organizers over the past 30 years has been about how do we expand that out to make people understand that it's not just the factory farm corporation coming in, it's causing this, it's systemic. And how do we get at that systematic problem? The factory farm work in Pennsylvania is very interesting because it broadened out to be about agribusiness corporations. In the Midwest, you have nine states that have passed, had passed laws banning corporations from farming. So trying to support family farmers by eliminating corporate farming. And so you know, cause and effect stuff is very important when you're doing this work because the law itself will reflect that. More questions. A couple more minutes. Now's your chance. Okay. Well, let's give one more round of applause for Thomas Lindsay. Thank you for being here. Okay. Now, time for lunch. Uh, so we will have the lunches all laid out and back there, nicely arranged by um, color coding system. Here is the system. <laughs> you got to look at your name tag, and the, the font color is uh, what you ordered, at least. So treat, try to remain um, true to what you ordered. We may have a few extra boxes, but we got to try to stick to the color code here. So if you're a purple name, that's the avocado folks. Um, blue is classic Italian, green is the grilled chicken, and red is turkey bacon ranch. So those are the box colors. Make sure you grab the correct box. There's also sides. So you can gra grab one side. There's uh, salad, there's fruit salad, tabbouleh, something else. But I think there's one side available, and then dessert and a drink. Um, and I guess the way we'll do this is if you are so lucky to sit near the the, the lunch, we'll go to the back row of tables first. And we need to sort of expedite this as quickly as possible, grab your box lunch, get back to your table, and then when we notice that uh, they're good to go, we'll go out to the next row. So thank you very much, and we'll um, have the student awards at 1230.
Okay. We have a few very special students to uh, recognize today. We have a lot of special students here. Thank you for being here. If you're uh, in our classes, we appreciate you being here. It's good to see so many students here. We have a, a few to recognize as our outstanding students, as um, you know, um, the faculty in each department got together, and uh, we'd like to take a vote. And there's a lot of deserving students, but these are these are the, the folks that rose, rose to the top for various reasons. GPA is in there, but they also do things that outside the classroom that make them leaders um, and make it uh, especially hopeful for the future of uh, public health and allied health with these young, young burdening professionals, burgeoning professionals. So we're going to have uh, Dr. Yost come up and take over the uh, student award session. Come on up, Dr. Yost. Thank you. All right, so as uh, Dr. Welch said, we will be presenting awards for outstanding students in the Department of Public and Allied Health. Our department represents the allied health professions in nutrition sciences, dietetics, public health, allied health science, and medical laboratory sciences, as well as other related graduate programs. For our awards, the faculties within each of the undergraduate programs nominated an outstanding senior who stood out or excelled in their program. The four seniors being recognized were selected from roughly 75 total senior level students nearing degree completion in their respective programs. Our first outstanding senior being recognized is Alex Wood. So Alex uh, is from our uh, public health program. Uh, Alex's extracurricular activities include uh, being a part of the Chapman Learning Community, Thompson Scholar, um, it was a campus tour guide, and Alex's favorite BGSU memories include attending a learning community's trip to Chicago, working in the admissions office. His proudest BGSU moments include helping the tour guide mentees completing training receiving and receiving the 2023 Thompson Perseverance Award. Alex's plans after graduation are to work in a local public health um, department with the REHS IT license and then potentially go to get his uh, MPH. So congratulations to Alex. Up next, we would like to recognize Amber Stoltz. So Amber is from our Medical Laboratory Science Program. Um, her extracurricular activities include being a part of the MLS, or Medical Laboratory Science Bench Buddies. Amber's favorite BGSU memories include being accepted into the MLS program and starting her first day of clinicals. Amber's proudest BGSU moments were when her daughter told her that it was really cool that she went back to school. Just going back to school as a non-traditional student and putting everything into um, her efforts in our program. Amber's plans after graduation are to work full-time as a medical laboratory scientist at Fulton County Health Center and potentially continuing on with a master's degree. So congratulations, Amber. Up next, we would like to recognize Lucas Wise. So Lucas is from our healthcare administration program, and Lucas is involved in the College of Health and Human Services Student Ambassador Program, as well as the Philosophy, Politics, Economics, and Law Club. Lucas's favorite BGSU memories include leading biology review sessions and all the time spent with friends. His proudest moments, receiving the President's Award for graduation and being the subject of an article on the BGSU website. Lucas's plans after graduation are to apply the skills um, that he's learned here at BGSU to the public health field. Congratulations, Lucas.
President's Award goes to students who graduate with a perfect 4.0 GPA. That's what that, yeah, that's hard to do. All right, next we would like to recognize Evelyn Duzer, and she comes to us from our dietetics program. So Evelyn is involved in the BGSU Student Nutrition Association and is a learning assistant for Intro to Human Food and Nutrition. Her favorite BGSU memories include conducting cooking classes and providing nutrition education for middle school students as part of her capstone and the many easy street dates with friends. Proudest moments, her capstone project being placed first at the Dietetics Capstone Day and finding out that she'll be graduating with honors. Evelyn's plans after graduation include attending graduate school um, to earn Masters of Dietetics and Nutrition and also being a premier health dietetic intern. Congratulations, Evelyn. All right, and we have one final awardee who is a recent graduate of our Masters of Food and Nutrition program. Hannah uh, Cook is being recognized as an outstanding graduate student in her program. And so Hannah's favorite BGSU memories are meeting her falcon flame during her time at BGSU, interning, studying, and tutoring with many friends and colleagues, Proudest moments include presenting at Campus Compact hosted at OSU, contributing to the Mobile Food Pantry, the Falcon Food Pantry, and Food for Thoughts initiatives. Advice for future grad students, prioritize self-care and believe in yourself. So since Hannah has uh, graduated, she is currently serving as the clinical dietitian at Mercy St. Vincent's Hospital. And Hannah is joining us virtually today, so please join me in giving her a round of applause for her outstanding performance. We actually have one more, one additional award. Um, Paige Roethlisberger, please uh, approach the podium. Paige um, entered a national competition and won that national competition. It was an essay competition. She beat out students from Baylor. Oh my gosh. Auburn, you know, like big time, big time schools, and uh, not to say BG isn't, but we're getting there. And, and thanks to students like Paige, um, she's leading the way on this. And so we have uh, a plaque that um, was sent from the American Col uh, College of Healthcare Executives, Richard J. Stull, Student Essay Competition in Healthcare Management, presented to Paige and Roethlisberger, Undergraduate Division, first place, 2024, Bowling Green State University. Okay. Um, before we get to our guest from Columbiana County, Damalola. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, two quick announcements. Mark Samodi is with us from the Midwest chapter of the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you are needing continuing education credits with MCACHI, please make sure you check with Mark there before you leave. And the food and nutrition students with Dr. Olmsted's section. You need to write a reflection paper. So that's your homework. Don't, don't blame me, that's, where's Dr. Olmsted? Okay, now we're, um, we're gonna get to the portion where we uh, hear from some folks who actually had to deal with the fallout of the uh, calamity that um, Thomas Lindsay mentioned several different environmental concerns, but now we're gonna focus on the, the derailment that happened in East Palestine about a year ago. And so we have um, a group of folks that have come to the, the podium and we're gonna invite them up on the dais together. And we'll hear first from Dr. Wes Vins, but um, yeah, come on up. I'll introduce Dr. Vins. He's the health commissioner for Columbiana County General Health District in Ohio. He's responsible for administering 
the district's public health programs, initiatives, and laws. Previously, he served 11 years with the District Board of Health, Mahoning County, and as a sanitarian and deputy director of environmental health. Prior to public service, Dr. Vins worked with Egon and Associates in Worthington, Ohio, as an environmental consultant to solid waste, waste supply, chemical, and petroleum industries. Uh, Dr. Vins received his Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science from Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania, Master of Sci degree in Environmental Studies from Youngstown State, and his doctoral degree in Public Policy and Administration from Westchester University in Pennsylvania. He has co-authored several published professional articles, routinely partners with a variety of entities by serving on numerous committees, isn't that true? <laughs> know how that feels, and uh, as an advisory at the local, state, and federal level. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Wes Vins. Okay, super, thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Welch. Appreciate the, uh, the introduction, um, and, and certainly appreciate uh, your attendance. Um, I think earlier today, uh, we heard from the dean that talked about uh, a village, right, um, advancing uh, our community, and, and it takes a village to be uh, part of that training program for our young people. So thank you for including us in your village. Uh, we, uh, we take this part of our, uh, our role in public health very seriously, uh, and I certainly want to recognize uh, my colleagues, Dr. Gretchen Nickel and uh, Laura Foss, our environmental director, uh, for coming along with me and for being my partner through this kind of response in addition to our COVID-19 experience. So, um, you know, the, the village part uh, is really important to us because uh, you are the future. And if we don't do this part uh, of our job, and, and as you can imagine, we're very busy still. Uh, Laura indicated she had six meetings one day last week. Uh, we probably still spend anywhere between 10 and 50% of our time on the East Palestine response, even though it's more than a year old. Uh, there is a lot of ongoing efforts, certainly a lot of committees and so on. And so that work continues, but this work is also very important. Uh, the work of us sharing our experience um, so that you uh, can see how we evolved and things that we did and perhaps you can adapt, understand, and perhaps even learn and advance the things that we have done. Uh, there was conversation earlier today about research and the need for research. I think it was a question. Uh, and that research continues. Uh, and so we try to facilitate that uh, as local health and as um, advocates for advancing the village and its knowledge into the future. So that research is ongoing and uh, hopefully uh, in the end we can all learn something from this and we can better position our community uh, to recover from this uh, the, this uh, experience. So I'll, I'll get started there. Uh, like I said, I have, I have the luxury of working with some great uh, individuals, Dr. Gretchen Nickel and, and Laura Faust, who will speak uh, uh, here shortly about their area of expertise. Uh, related to this, uh, but again, thank you for attending and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Dr. Welch and, and Bowling Green State University for, for us to be here. Next slide, please. I think we'll start with this uh, really to get, get the understanding if, if those of you who have been through public health uh, and some training understand the importance of analyzing and understanding your community. Not every community is the same. Uh, we have Columbiana County, we have about 100,000 residents in our community. This is a sub-community within our community, and it actually impacted multiple areas and multiple sub-communities within Columbiana County. Specifically, if we talk about East Palestine, it's a community of less than 5,000. Uh, it's a small um, community with uh, rural roots, uh, historical, some industry, but light industry. Uh, we have the fortunate uh, luxury of having two local community hospitals that support our healthcare systems. Uh, but there is no large industry. Uh, there is no large political footprint. Um, these are typically legacy families, legacy communities. Uh, and as the Columbiana County Health District, you know, it's, it's really our responsibility, even though we have 18 individuals uh, that work in our agency, uh, to provide public health services throughout the entire county, including East Palestine. And so those service areas, as some of you may or may not know, uh, really focus on food service, uh, septic systems, birth certificates, death certificates, uh, vaccines, communicable disease, and preparedness for emergencies. Um, next slide, please. On, on February 3rd um, of 2023, we had uh, the derailment. It involved uh, around 141 uh, rail cars were in the train, uh, 50 of those derailed, 11 of them had hazardous materials. Uh, and, I, and I bring this slide up so that folks understand the first and paramount issue is to protect life and health, right? Protect the community. 
you have to put the fire out, right? And so public health, we're not firefighters. That's not our role. And so putting out the fire is the primary task. Uh, and you can see that here, and, and we certainly appreciate all the work that the 40, maybe 50 responding agencies in addition to law enforcement and uh, uh, other first responders that include utilities and, believe it or not, media uh, as first responders to communicate the message of the event uh, into the community. So uh, if you take this small community that we just talked about of less than 5,000 people, it's the middle of the night, there's a huge fire, uh, and all of these uh, emergency responders are trying to enter the community while residents are trying to leave. So uh, very difficult, very complex situation. Um, but fortunately for us, as you can see on the slide, there was no hospital surge. That was our, as an agency, that was our, that was our first uh, concern. Uh, was to establish that partnership and reconnect with our hospital systems and our healthcare providers to say, we have a situation, we need to prepare for the surge. Do you see a surge? If there is a surge, we need to modify. How do we, how do we implement a change? How do we create a regional relay system, which we had to utilize during the COVID-19 response? How do we handle mass casualty events? How do you plan for that? Well, you reach out to your partners, uh, both locally and regionally. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so as part of the, the public health response, I, I kind of broke this out. It's very challenging because it is a complex response. Um, and there are so many things that are happening. We have to remember that there are other people doing other things. Um, and when we start to see state resources, regional resources with three states that are involved in the response, uh, local, state, and federal agencies, again, multiple states with multiple uh, structures, you have to really focus on what it is that your lane, what is your lane? And I have that in a future slide is to stay in your lane, right? Because you have to stay most effective as possible uh, using the resources that you have. Uh, in this, I've identified these four individual items uh, really to share with you today. And the most uh, important I think is incident command, right? So we talk about the structure, how do you respond? Well, incident command is certainly a big, big piece to that. Uh, and I'll go into a little more detail in a second. Public information. How do we communicate the message? How is that done in a complex response? Uh, so very important if you haven't done that and you haven't considered the communications piece, it's probably one of the most important pieces to a response, communicating uh, among yourselves and with your partners and then again with the community. And then finally, we have the development of the temporary health assessment, which I think Dr. Nichols is going to talk about, and the implementation of our residential well sampling program to protect groundwater, which again is in our lane uh, and Director Foss is going to talk about that. Those primary responses, as you can see on the slide, they evolved, right? So this is not a stagnant situation. So if you, you, you have to understand that as, as the situation evolves, so does your response, right? So we have to stay light on our feet. We have to stay quick. We have to communicate. Um, it is not a stagnant situation. Next slide, please. As I spoke of about incident command, um, and, and this is for your students, uh, I'd encourage you to, to search out the FEMA website. Uh, there's incident command training. Right, Ann? Incident command training, we can all do that. Um, and uh, it's, it's so there's ICS courses, you do them online. Uh, you get a certificate for it. Um, and to be, as a local health district and a potential employer for students, this is something that you can do in advance and that you can come to an interview and say, these are things that I've done, this is what I have awareness to. So there's the ICS trainings that you can do. I think it's uh, 100, 200, 700, 800, there's a whole list. You can get all kinds of training. Uh, if you're not sure what training would be best for you, call your local health department. Um, they can help guide you through that. So very important piece so that you understand how you might fit into this because everybody participates in incident command to truly be effective, including the local health district, including the local health commissioner. And so if you look at this in incident command structure, this is the entire response. You see that at this point, we're not in incident command. COVID-19, we were in incident command at the very top of the chart. And this uh, chart, our role is multifaceted. Uh, and first and foremost is we're an advisory group to the overall response, not just us, not just local public health, state public health, federal public health, multiple states, multiple perspectives, uh, not just from the public sector, but also from the private sector uh, to share the information and knowledge base that we have to advise the incident response. In addition to that, which is the parts that uh, <clears throat> really Dr. Nickel and, and Laura Faust will talk about, is our operational units. The operational units are the action pieces that our agency, things that we actually functioned uh, and performed. Next slide, please. Um, the public information sec section, uh, again, is, is also very, very important, but it's broke into many different pieces. Um, incident command helps formulate your public information messaging. So we have local public health messaging, 
but that messaging needs to be incorporated and integrated with other messaging. Uh, there's advantageous to be able to participate as part of a bigger group because that helps to ensure that the message is consistent across all sectors. The incident of itself is gonna have a larger message and then we are only a piece of that message. It helps to reduce uh, conflict of information. It also ensures the prioritization of information, both flowing into and out of the emergency through the JIC, which is a Joint Information Center, typically handled by public information officers. An important piece for us, as well as any emergency, is to make sure that that public information officer is designated. And when you have an incident like this, and we have to, we had the luxury of having some expertise in house to be able to deal with that for us. But we also had a new awareness to the exposure and the interest that we saw from national media. We've always had media training. We take that very serious. Our ability to communicate with the public and with our local media, media has always been a priority for us. However, we were, we were uh, very stressed with the, the national media, the pressure that comes from national media, the demands, the, uh, the interest, the questioning, uh, because there is so much so, so often and so fast. We want to get to everyone because we need to understand how important the media is to our response. So public health is part of that response. The challenges in responding are other messages. We talked about the Joint Information Center where all those messages came together and it worked for us, but there's also other people sharing messaging that may be inconsistent with your messaging. Misinformation perhaps, or just information that maybe is delayed or it's coming from a different perspective. So that in and of itself is a challenge. So it's very important to take communications and public information seriously. Next slide, please. As part of that public information and communication, uh, you end up with opportunities to have public meetings. This public meeting, as in, in others, can be very challenging. They're very large. As you can imagine, there's a lot of intensity, right? There's a lot of stress, a lot of urgency, uh, a lot of concern among the community. There are a lot of questions that don't have answers. Early in the response, it's very difficult because it's complex and it's a multi-staged and an evolving situation. However, the need for information, as best you have it, to be transparent and open is important. The large public meetings that, that do often sometimes present security issues um, are very difficult at moments when you're trying to coordinate a message and there are so many questions. This uh, photograph that I share here is uh, Director uh, Bruce Vanderhoff, uh, State Director of Health. Uh, one of our, our strongest partners during the response was the Ohio Department of Health in addition to our other local health districts. In this meeting, as you can see, uh, was in the gymnasium of, a lo of the local uh, school, uh, was one of these public meetings that we had talked about as being very intense uh, and very demanding. Dr. Vanderhoff did an excellent job of not just communicating publicly, right? Because as you hear questions asked in a very public forum, there are a lot of challenges. In addition to the public forum, Dr. Vanderhoff, as well as our staff, take the interpersonal communication very important. So when a resident has a question, they're gonna reach out to us. That public information communication needs to also not happen just with the public, but as I had said previously with your partners, also with your own staff, right? So we had people in the field doing water samples, interacting with the public every day, questions in the field. We had residents that would call to our office because of the trust that they have in us as a local agency. They would call us because they want the truth. They wanna know really what's going on. They need to know what they should do. What are the risks? Uh, they, want question, they want answers to their questions. They would call us. It's very important that not only do we have the message for us to share with the media, but also for our staff to share with the public and for us to share with our partners. So the messaging is, is very, uh, very pivotal to the entire response. Next slide, please. And I think that boils down to partners. Partners, 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 partners. I can't say that enough. We would have never made it through this without our partners. Our state partners, our federal partners, our local partners, um, our community partners. Some people that aren't public health were are still some of our biggest partners. Certainly the hospital, certainly our healthcare providers, certainly our local media. These are all partners that we need to uh, rely on and integrate with. And so I've tried to capture a whole list of them here. Um, and I have to take a moment uh, and uh, point to uh, near the bottom, right? So we have two very important pieces to that. Academia. Academia is a partner in this response. 
Your university has a role in a response like this. Um, there's a lot of technical expertise at a university. There's a lot of objectivity, but also most importantly bring a university and academia, and we see this right now during the research activities that are happening in and around uh, this response, they bring trust. The community trusts academia, um, and that's a very important piece. I know some of my colleagues are gonna talk about trust, but trust is pivotal, pivotal to make progress with the community. Another very important partner I have to point out, Norfolk Southern. Norfolk Southern, the owner of the train, was a partner in the response, still is a partner in the response. They have expertise, they have knowledge, and they work in tandem at the same time as us. They have information that is important to us. We have public information that is also important to them. So let us not forget that our private partners, even the folks involved in the response, are also your partners. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Gretchen Nickel, uh, who handled the, uh, the assessment and the clinical side. Dr. Nickel. Do you see it? I'm missing the clicker. You got it? Hi, everybody. Thank you. As Wes said, I'm Gretchen Nickel. I am a practicing physician at East Liverpool City Hospital. I'm also the chief medical officer there, and I do have the opportunity to serve as the medical director for the Columbia County Health District. So I'd like to give you a little bit of information on the hospital first, and that will help establish how we already had a collaborative model in place between the hospital and the health department. So the hospital itself is a 130-bed small community hospital with a rural designation. It's a not-for-profit hospital. It's been in this community for a very long time, opening in 1905. And it managed to stay independent for, for quite a while until 2016 when it joined a much, lar much larger healthcare organization known as Prime Healthcare. They're based in Ontario, California. We also sponsor two residency programs, an internal medicine program and a family medicine program. And this was started in 2011 with the purpose of bringing in primary care to this underserved area. We did develop a good relationship with the health department during the COVID efforts. Both hospitals in the community, East Liverpool and Salem Regional Medical Center partnered with them to inform the public of all of our efforts that we were doing to prepare for COVID even before the first patient was admitted to either hospital. Then during the initial surge, we partnered with them on a daily basis via Zoom meetings so that we could update each other on what was going on in both hospitals. We do have a prison in the community known as Elkton Federal Correctional Institute, and they had a large outbreak early on in the pandemic. This overwhelmed both hospitals very quickly. So we worked with the local department and the state agencies to create a relay system where we involved multiple hospitals throughout Ohio to allow us to safely admit these patients into a hospital that would allow us not to burden both hospitals in the community. We also provided testing for COVID and returned to provide vaccines for inmates at the local county jail and the East Liverpool resident physicians helped with the health department through a mass vaccination clinic where we were able to provide COVID vaccines. Dr. Nickel? Yes. Question from the peanut gallery. Are we on the right slide? Or Thank have you, you. advanced? I, and I can advance. If the clicker is malfunctioning, that would not be the first time. <laughs> it's not, it's me. Okay. Do you need me to advance? I might need you to, yes. It doesn't seem to be. It's not working for me. Okay. Tell me, okay. No, we're gonna go back. There we are, okay. Then just say next slide and I'll, okay. I'll advance next it. Next slide, please. So when the temporary clinic opened up in East Palestine, it really wasn't unusual for Wes to contact me when they felt that they needed a physician to cover in that clinic. 
the clinic opened on February 21st of last year, and initially there was no physician there. Initially, there was a registered nurse that did an intake of the patients, and they completed an ACE survey, which was an assessment of chemical exposure survey. And then the community resident said, you know, we really want to see a doctor. We have questions we want to talk to them about. We have symptoms we want to talk to them about. We'd like to have an examination. And we want, they asked for a physician to help them guide treatment. Next slide, please. So on the 22nd, the next day, Wes contacted me and said, do you think that you could help with this and provide a clinic or a physician to our clinic? So I spoke with the then CEO of the hospital, which was Krista McFadden, who's pictured here, and the rest of the executive leadership team. We all felt that there was a need for this and that we were able to fill it. And we were able to start providing a physician the next day on the 23rd. This was not an agreement between the hospital and the local health department, but an agreement between the hospital and the, the Ohio Department of Health. But it was completely facilitated by Wes in that relationship that we had already had from previous efforts. Next slide. So the temporary assessment clinic was held in the basement of the First Church of Christ, um, and we had five rooms there in the basement. Three rooms were for patient care. There was a room that was used as a command center, and then a room that we could use for documentation or other purposes. And our local community action agency also brought in a mobile van that could provide an extra exam room. Next slide. So we had enough staff, physicians and nurses, to see four patients an hour. And patients were seen by appointment. However, nobody that needed to see a physician or had questions or wanted to complete the ACE survey was ever turned away. Next slide. So from a patient perspective, they would come to the clinic. They would have an intake by the registered nurse. They would complete the ACE survey, which was an important, um, important information for us because it talked about where they were, the duration of the chemical exposure, as well as any symptoms that they might be having. Then they had a physician evaluation. This included obtaining a history from them, what if any symptoms they were having, and a physical examination. The biggest issue with the temporary assessment clinic is we did not have the ability to do any treatment from the clinic. So this was the opportunity for us as physicians to help facilitate any treatment that a patient would need. So this would involve calling their, their primary care provider or reaching out to the toxicologist that was available to us to ask any questions that the patient might have about chemical exposure, as well as referrals to any specialists that they would need. What we found out very quickly were, was that the three main specialists we were in need of was pulmonology, dermatology, and ear, nose, and throat. This can be difficult because these are some of the specialty physicians that take a long time to get an appointment with. Through our community affiliations that we have with various different hospitals, including Salem, which is there in the county, and the next county over with Mercy Health, we were able to get specialists from these three fields who said they will see our patients from the assessment clinic within the next day or sometimes even that same day. Primary care was also a problem because a lot of these patients did not have a primary care doctor. So we needed to be able to establish care for these patients quickly too. We did have primary care physicians who were willing to see them in that same expedited fashion, but the biggest problem with that and with the specialty care is that this required travel for these patients. So we have an access to care issue as well now. And next slide, and next slide. We had mental health services on site. This was extremely important and it was actually utilized by the vast majority of the patients that we saw in the temporary clinic. So we had a mental health professional right there that could talk to anybody that needed it. And we had a lot of information that we could give the patients so they could take it with them if they wanted to follow up at a later date. Next slide. So what we really found out during this initial part of the clinic was that the patients were asking about ongoing screening. They're here with us, some had symptoms, some did not, but many wanted to know what's the next step? How are we going to be tested? How are you going to follow us? What's the surveillance process going to be? 
And those that didn't have a primary care physician had no way of even getting any of these potentially recommended labs independently because they were not yet established with somebody. So as I said, by mid-March, we realized we had a bit of a problem with this and that we needed to have a, a permanent clinic there in East Palestine. This clinic would function as both a primary care office to provide that ongoing health care that any community needs, as well as serve as a site where both community members and the first responders involved in this situation would be able to have that ongoing surveillance testing and be able to be enrolled into that program. On March 22nd, we were asked from the hospital to meet with the governor and with members from the Ohio Department of Health to discuss this permanent clinic. They asked the hospital if we would be willing to own and operate this clinic with help from the Ohio Department of Health to get it off the ground and to do that transition from the temporary clinic to the permanent clinic. This was on March 22nd. We agreed to this. We wanted to be part of this. They wanted us to have the clinic in place by April 10th, which is a, a big jump to be able to create a clinic in that short period of time. We got very lucky as, next slide, there was a clinic that had previously been used by a primary care physician about a mile and a half from the temporary assessment clinic. However, it had been without use for many years but much of the equipment was still there. The furniture was still there. It needed some minor renovations, which we were able to do. And we were able to meet the deadline to open the clinic by April 10th. It has four exam rooms as well to be able to take care of many patients at the same time. It's, it's staffed with a primary care provider. And most importantly, it has laboratory services so that we can do that ongoing screening for these patients without them having to leave the community. The next site for them to be able to get such things, you can do the next slide too, please, is actually between 25 and 35 minutes away. So that was a key for us that we would have the ability to do that lab value for these patients. Next slide. So initially, ODH helped tremendously by providing us with nurses to help room patients and obtain information from patients. And most importantly, these were the same nurses that ODH had used in the temporary assessment clinic, which means these nurses were well aware of the issues in the community and what these patients had been going through. ODH also provided us with plum cases so we could have internet access because at the time that this was being used previously, it did not have that and we needed some time to be able to get that in place on our own. And next slide. So as far as that initial screening and ongoing health surveillance is concerned, this protocol was provided to us from the Ohio Department of Health through their toxicologist. And it includes a physical exam and, again, asking about any symptoms that they might be having uh, in lab work. Um, complete blood count, that includes your white count, your red count, your platelet counts, and a comprehensive metabolic panel. That is looking for electrolytes, it's looking for kidney function, and it's looking for liver function, as well as a urine test. The protocol is you get a, a test at baseline, you repeat it in six months, and then you do it yearly thereafter. The primary care part of this clinic is like any other primary care clinic, but this screening portion and this ongoing health surveillance is free of charge to anybody that comes in to enroll in that. The clinic is still growing. We're still having people come in to um, have their first screening, both first responders and community residents for this. We're not exactly sure, next slide. And next slide. We're not exactly sure how many years this will be recommended. Right now, the recommendation is that we'll continue this yearly screening for 15 years. However, it could be extended to 20, depending on what these next 15 years bring us. Thank you. Director Faust, I'll have you just say next slide as well. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, 
this slide. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I'm the environmental director at Columbiana County Health District, and if you don't know what that entails, it entails supervising the environmental programs, <clears throat> one of which is the public water system program, which is, sorry, pub, private water system program, which are water wells. Uh, so this is how I got involved with this, uh, what I'm about to tell you in East Palestine. So the derailment occurred in uh, Friday, and on that next Monday, we came to the office, and right away we wanted to talk to the Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Health. The Ohio Department of Health, because they regulate along with us the public, private water wells, excuse me, the Ohio EPA, because they regulate the public water wells. So we want to know what does this mean? What do we need to do? What, what's going to happen? Those are the questions that we have here. Um, we don't really know, and so pretty quickly we brought in Norfolk Southern, as Wes mentioned, as a partner. Uh, they were able to provide the manifest of what was on the train. We still didn't know exactly what we wanted to test for, but then we had a list of, of what might be introduced into the environment and then possibly into drinking water wells. Um, we worked closely with Summit Environmental Services, which is a local laboratory about an hour from our office. They were able to help us determine what type of tests that we want to take um, on this water. And through that, uh, they also helped with the sampling procedures because our staff isn't really um, practiced in sampling for a lot of different types of chemicals. So uh, once we realize we're going to test for 186 analytes, 17 bottles, if you've ever taken a water sample, it usually doesn't take very long, but it takes quite a while to fill up 17 bottles. So we usually get a lot of awe in that when I mention it to the sanitarians. Um, some of the chemicals that we tested for, we realized that there were not established drinking water standards for them. So uh, CDC, ATSDR, the Agency for Substance for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry came in to help us determine what is, if we have a detection of this analyte in the water, what is it going to be considered safe, is what is considered unsafe. So they established those limits and they also helped us with developing a sampling plan. So this group that I mentioned, all of these people continue to talk. They actually had a meeting today uh, that I missed because I'm here, but we talked daily, weekly, now we're every other week. Uh, we're still communicating with all of, with all of this because it's been ongoing. We established a sampling plan, and right away, Sunday, um, sorry, would it be Friday, we sampled the, the public water system. That's the village wells. Around maybe 3,000 people or so are on that village water supply. So we were able to sample that. And then we moved to a voluntary program to sample the private water wells. Um, we started that on Sunday. And it was voluntary because, as Mess mentioned, it's a rural community. Um, a lot of the residents are very interested in their property rights, and so we didn't want to impose on anyone. But we had a lot of people interested in the program. So we developed a call center staffed by Norfolk Southern's contractors, and people were calling from all over the place, maybe even from some in this area. We're getting tons of calls. We also canvassed door to door because we weren't really sure where the water wells were all located and who owned them. We, this was the contractors again, our staff uh, was spread too thin to be doing this. So we started with 245 water wells uh, that we sampled. And our sampling plan was to do that every 30 to 45 days. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we were getting calls from all over the place, so we needed to prioritize where we were going to sample. The map on the left is the priority zones. Uh, the rectangle at the top is the village of East Palestine, and then headed south uh, is the second priority zone. That follows the surface water down to a village called Negley. So we were going to sample inside these zones, and everybody that called on the outside of those zones, uh, we put them on a list basically to see if we might have funding, staff, or time to be able to sample them at a later date. Deciding these zones was this potable water group that I mentioned. Um, the, the map on the right, you can see the, that map shows a lot of different things, but I'm showing that to indicate the groundwater movement, which are the dark arrows coming towards the center. That's the direction the groundwater is moving. The derailment occurred at the red little sort of, I don't know what shape that would be, almost, almost rectangle at the top, at the right. And then the surface water, you can see, moves to the center and then moves south and eventually goes down to the Ohio River. The municipal well supply is located on this map, kind of um, just bottom left middle-ish there. It's all kind of the same color, but it's little maroon dots. That's where the village wells are. And there were also sentinel wells that were drilled to make sure that we could uh, catch anything, if detect anything, excuse me, between where the derailment occurred and where the municipal wells were. Sorry, next slide. 
So Norfolk Southern did install these Sentinel wells that are monitoring wells that are tested for similar things that we're testing in the, the water wells. Um, mention, Wes mentioned that we're a rural county, but he didn't mention the size of our health department, I don't think. We had 18 employees at this time which is a pretty small department, uh, five environmental staff. So five employees that are capable of going out and sampling wells, which was just impossible for us to do this alone. He did mention that we called on a lot of other local health departments. This is something that in planning occurs, but in reality doesn't really occur as far as my experience is concerned. So this was a big deal. We had 12 other local health departments send their staff one week at a time to come help us sample, and they postponed their postpone all of their work um, that they had to do, their regular food inspections and whatnot to come help us and to help our community. They sent the expert staff that knew about water wells, knew about community, and knew how to talk to residents that were under high stress situations. So we're so, so grateful for these, uh, all of these counties that helped. And we were asked by other multiple counties if we needed assistance and we didn't use all of those, so I don't wanna leave anybody out. Um, anyway, so field teams, I said we have five CCHG employees, we decided we needed four field teams of two employees each. So we're running eight samplers at a time. We wanted to do that in case there was any type of liability. We wanted to make sure that the results that we were gonna to provide to the residents could be backed up in court. Um, all of this support, time, money uh, was, is, is and was funded by Norfolk Southern. They're paying for the, all the lab costs and all of the employees. Next slide, please. So as the program evolves, the Ohio EPA continues to sample the village water supply. Um, our sample times decreased, and that's partially because we reduced the number of analytes. We're now only testing 29 different chemicals in the water. We did that because we've determined more of what was on the train, what was involved. Um, we've also looked at what has been in the surface water and in the air and in the ground around to be able to reduce that list. Um, we established additional zones, so, so we added two more locations of where we would be able to sample zone three and zone four. That was to align the unilateral administrative order uh, issued by the US EPA. Zone three is the one mile radius around the derailment, you can see in the diagram. Zone four is that green squiggle that runs from Negley all the way down to the Ohio River, and that's a 250 foot buffer um, along that creek. Um, we now are running one sanitarian, which is an employee that we, full, we hired full time to do the sampling. So we've reduced the amount of sampling that's been done. Um, we hired her last April and she's been great. She came right out of college with an undergrad in public health and she's run in there and she's, it's been fantastic. So grateful for her. Um, we are now sampling every 45 to 60 days and we're looking to reduce that. Next slide, please. So here's the rundown of the samples that our office has taken. And I think I failed to acknowledge the fact that Norfolk Southern and their contractors are also sampling alongside us. So when we go out to a property, we go together and we take our own samples from our own bottles and then we turn around and send them to our own labs and the res resident gets two separate reports. In any case, we're up to over 1300 water samples that we've taken and you can see all the different rounds. Um, we have about 1,200 final results back, and you can see we had some detections. Um, we had four exceedances. So I have them listed there. One of, all of those have been fully investigated and resampled and found not to be related to the derailment, although the chemicals may have been associated in theory with the derailment. What we've tested for here, we've determined, is not from the train. Um, funny story for all you public health people, so remember this if you ever need to know it. Nathaline, which is on the bottom of the list, is found in mothballs, and some residents in Ohio may use mothballs in their basement to get rid of snakes to the point where it's so strong it gets, ends up in your water and in your water sample. So fun fact there on nathalene. Some challenges that we've, I think we'll talk about it maybe in a little bit, but I'm, oh, next slide, please. I think that uh, I skipped ahead here on the challenges since I have them listed. The priority zones, we had to draw a line somewhere. That was difficult. Everybody wanted their water sampled. It was hard to explain to the resident that all the samples were taking between their house and the derailment and are actually telling us that your water's okay because they want their own water sampled. So we had to give them some information about third party samplers certified through the Ohio Department of Health to see if they wanted to pay for their own outside sampling. Um, report interpretation was rough. I think somebody referenced earlier about science skills in the public. Um, 
these final reports from the lab are complicated for me to understand, and I had to explain what these things were and why sometimes there's numbers instead of a zero. Trying to explain that to a resident who is scared for their life, basically, scared for their water, very emotional. <laughs> it was rough. We developed an interpretation guide with some of our partners that I think helped a little bit, but I called every single resident with their water sample results. And I personally continue to call if we get any kind of detection. So it's that one-on-one -on -one connection that allows the public to trust you. Um, I mentioned that we're scheduling through the contractor. The contractor continues to schedule. That was a little bit of a challenge because residents would call our office because they know us and they say, hey, I need a sample. Well, you got to call this hotline number and they didn't really like that, but we didn't have the staff to to man a hotline, so that's the way that ran. Um, media, Wes mentioned. Another interesting thing is that the media was following similar sampling teams to private residents and wanting to video us sampling. 17 bottles takes a long time, as I mentioned, to fill. And if you're filling 17 bottles of water with CNN over your shoulder, <laughs> you might screw up. We want to get the best sample for our resident. We don't want to make any mistakes. So absolutely, we're not interested in having that filmed, which may have been, looked a little suspicious to some people, but we just were trying to do the best that we could. So we had to train our field staff what to do when the media was following them. We also had some residents videoing themselves, so that was interesting. There were third-party independent samplers that came in and sampled water for a various number of things for various reasons. Um, that was a challenge because the resident then had three samples, maybe not all for the exact same chemicals, and trying to explain yes or no, this or that to them when they already might not be trusting of the government or what's going on was, was and continues to be difficult for us. The other local health department work was put on hold. Uh, for the most part. Um, we still tried to run basic functions, but our department, and Wes mentioned, we're still working on this response. So some of the things got set aside, some of the smaller tasks that we didn't have to worry about right away, they got put aside. Um, and that's a challenge because there are expectations and there are deadlines and goals that we have to reach to continue to serve the rest of our residents. Um, Finally, detections unrelated to the derailment. I mentioned the mothballs. There were other detections and not exceedances that we have found in the water. And that's been hard educating the residents that their well um, may not have pure water. It's not just water. There could be other chemicals in it too. Um, and, and so that's been, that's been a challenge. Next slide. Oh, I guess that's, oh, that's the end of me. Okay, sorry, I thought I had another one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, Laura, appreciate that. Um, that uh, detail on the, on the groundwater sampling piece. I just wanted to uh, take a minute, if I could, here, uh, and kind of wrap up um, our response and, and really start to talk about the ongoing piece, right? Uh, Laura had just mentioned that it's not over. We do still continue to work on this, uh, this response, along with our other partners. And, and these were just a few of the points that we still continue to be the local contact point for the resident. Uh, if they have a question, call us. If a local official has a question, call us. Um, we want to be that point. If we don't have that answer, we're going to find it for them and get them uh, in touch with someone that does. Academic research, uh, there's lots of research that's happening. NIEH just recently funded uh, six projects to the amount of $2 million. That, uh, that work continues, along with a lot of other uh, academic research that's out there in the field. Uh, and we appreciate the work and the investment they're making. The ACE survey, which is the Assessment of Chemical Exposure Survey, there was the initial, initial survey that was done uh, as part of the uh, Temporary Health Assessment Clinic, and others could participate voluntarily. We're doing the one-year follow-up uh, with our partners from the Ohio Department of Health in Pennsylvania to kind of see after a year uh, what things are, what are the concerns of the residents. Uh, public information sessions still happen. We have one next week, which is just going to summarize some academic um, uh, results or kind of a progress report from academia as to how that research is, is progressing. Uh, and there are routine opportunities for the public information. Uh, the agency FEP plan, so that's public health emergency preparedness, we continue to update our plans on what we learned. Uh, we need to make sure that we stay moving forward with that. We continue to see media inquiries. We have funding. Uh, obviously, those discussions are very important uh, to continue to do our work. 
uh, relationship maintenance, right? So we still have to stay connected with our other responsibilities as a public health agency um, and continue that work is, is important to us as well. There are uh, public records requests that we continue to work through, right? So we're a public entity. So the information that we have uh, and some of our documents are just that, they're public information. And so we have to make sure those are available uh, and we continue to work on that as well. Advocate for change. Right, we, we need to change some policies. We, we heard some conversation earlier today. There are uh, changes that need to happen both in a policy side and maybe in the regulation side. Uh, and maybe the things that we've learned can carry forward and, and improve things going forward. Uh, the permanent health clinic is gonna continue. That's an ongoing process. We're gonna continue to monitor. There's also ongoing discussion as to what that framework looks like long-term, 20 years, 30 years, 15 years, we don't know. Uh, what are those pieces, parts, we, we don't know. Uh, so we're trying to bring a lot of that information together. The residential well sampling will also continue. Um, and lessons learned uh, on the right side of the slide. Uh, I, I mentioned previously the ICS uh, training, 214s. A 214 is an activity sheet. So it's a federal FEMA form that you use in all federal responses. We still use the 214 form that we started to use in 2020 during COVID. Um, so we still use those. Uh, keep your plans up to date. Um, it's very important that you have a dedicated public information officer and use the JIC, that joint information center that I spoke of. Um, we obviously have a lesson, learned a lot of lessons from our media demands and uh, we continue to work through advancing our training there to make sure that we're in a good position to be able to communicate effectively with our media partners as well as our community partners and the public. Um, maintain timely information, right? It's very important. If you have good information, if you don't share that information, the, informa the, the void that's out there uh, of information will be filled with misinformation. So it's very important that we communicate timely information of what we have. Uh, maintain those relationships, not just with your partners, but maintain trust with the community. Once you lose trust with the community, it's very difficult to regain. And that is, that is very important to us. Um, and obviously we've got long-term health uh, and environmental monitoring, right? Those are things that we recognize and we learned uh, that this is a long-term commitment. Uh, as you can see, we're into this more than a year and we're still committed to this. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, Dr. Kier, I think you wanted to move on to some questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I Actually, Dr. Kier, I would like to introduce you. Welcome to the podium. Dr. Andrew Kier earned his PhD in poli-sci from Colorado State University, started as an assistant prof here at BG in the fall of 2011. His research focuses on energy politics and policy and the role that competing interest groups play in state and federal policy making. He has a dual appointment between the Department of Political Science and the Department of Environment and Sustainability. Dr. Kier combines his educational and professional experience as a geologist with his knowledge of environmental and energy policy to teach a variety of graduate and undergrad classes ranging from public policy and administration to energy, the environment, and sustainability. Thank you, Dr. Kier, for leading our next session, which is the informal kind of panel, expert panel discussion. There is an actual, uh, an extra wireless uh, microphone up there. If you want to pass that along the, the way or if the lapel mics are working, then that works too. So whatever you prefer. Give us a second while we uh, put on our individual mics, I think. Here. Okay. Thank I you. I've got one too. And did anyone else recognize the two trains that have whistled since the event began? I think that's the universe calling us to action, maybe. So maybe one more will happen here, but just what would happen if an accident were to occur during our event? Can everyone hear well, me okay through this? Maybe we test all of our students. See. Um, yes, I'd like to thank the College of Health and Human Services for sponsoring this event and for our panelists coming from Columbiana County. Um, it's quite a drive and you've made a sacrifice to be here, but from the sounds of it, you've made a lot of sacrifices. So we, we appreciate your, your expertise and and all the work that you've done as, as health professionals. So let's give them a round of applause. So I'm gonna moderate this panel a little bit and ask a few questions and, and start out with a general question um, to, to the panel. What was your biggest challenge during the initial phase of this responding to this derailment? For me, it was misinformation and mistrust, which is similar to what Wes was just saying. Dr. Nickel, I think maybe turn, or yeah, is it on? Is that better? Yes. 
So for me, it was misinformation and mistrust. There was a lot of information circulating after the derailment, particularly from the medical standpoint of vinyl chloride, as many of you may have heard about, and a lot of requests for vinyl chloride testing, which really wasn't something that could routinely be done, and 24 to 48 hours after the fact would not have been helpful either. But there was a lot of requests for that, and some people were obtaining that and then they were bringing this information to us and asking us to interpret it, which is very difficult to do under the, the circumstances and the setting in which we were in. Yeah, and most people don't know what vinyl chloride is and what it does to the human body. Right? Another very good challenge. The primary care physicians in the area, myself included, had little to no experience with this sort of situation in toxicology. I don't have an experience in toxicology, as most of the primary cares did not. So this really required a lot of coordinated effort on behalf of the Ohio Department of Health to educate us in that area, the primary care physicians in the area, and how to address these issues and to give us the best information so that we could provide that to our patients. Because understandably so, they were all very concerned about this situation, including the long-term potential effects. Yeah, a quick Google search of vinyl chloride would say, it's a carcinogen. So of right. course the community is gonna say, how's it gonna affect me? What's exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and we did have webinars that were put together for the area primary care providers. Um, and toxicologists were extremely helpful to us throughout this entire situation continuing now where we can reach out to a toxicologist and have our questions answered, so that then we can relay that to the patient. Laura, yeah, how about you? I, I already kind of told us the challenges, but a personal challenge um, working on the local health department level is, one, wrapping your head around, this is happening here, this is happening to us, everything that has gone on, if you followed it, it's just it kind of blows your mind. Um, and two is, what do I need to do? Like, how do I do this and that? And, and the local health department, Mes Wes mentioned the media, I'm also the public information officer. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to help with the pot of water group. I'm dealing with the media, and that's what happens at local public health. You do what you have to do. And so that was a huge challenge, and that's a challenge that I think every health department, uh, even when they're not in an emergency, has to deal with. So you were wearing multiple hats at one time? Yep. Simultaneously. Yeah, and the fact that you had five people to do all of that sampling is just Understaffed. Yes, yeah. Well, staffed for under normal times, perfectly. Yes. Understaffed for a derailment. <laughs> well, it's good that you had those, those county relationships established. We're very, very, out. very lucky and very grateful. How about you, Wes? Yeah, just to follow up with uh, what Laura said, know your neighbors, right? I mean, if you're working on the fence at your house or if you're working on a community project or if you're a local health district and you have a train derailment, you need to know who your neighbors are, right? So the best time to do that is before you have an incident. Uh, for, for us, I, I have to raise the challenge uh, that we experienced, and I think Dr. Welch kind of touched on it, the train whistle, right? Um, trauma and stress are huge, and there are lots of little triggers um, to, uh, to those kind of experiences. And so we have to recognize that not just for the community, because the community still has, um, there's still stressful responses, there's still stress-induced um, concern. and. You know, long term, can my kids play in the yard? Uh, what's my health going to be like in five years or 20 years? And so stress is a big piece to this. And so we don't always integrate that with the science portion or the medical, the physiology piece of public health. And so to bring our partners in, again, back to partners, bring in our mental health partners and our behavioral partners and our stress counselors, that is a very, very important piece um, to recognize uh, the stress piece. I think that, that was a challenge for us to recognize, well, there's more to this uh, public health response than just the pieces that we have. Um, and that doesn't apply just to the public, right? Laura kind of, I think you heard a little bit of that in her, in her voice just now. There was stress related to that for us, right? Still is. Not just for us, but those that are close to us. So our community uh, partners, our staff, uh, and our home life. Uh, it's all uh, kind of intertwined in that stress exudes itself in all of those venues. So uh, take care of yourself, right? So we try to take care of each other and, and give each other a break if we can and rely on our partners for that stress, uh, that stress support. Yeah, and this is coming on, you know, after the, the pandemic or on the, uh, on the, the I suppose, the, 
the downslope of the pandemic, if you will. Yeah. So the, the stress of the pandemic and then you have the stress of this community disaster um, puts you all under stress as well. Um, so the actually, it kind of leads to my next question very nicely. How did the pandemic and your response to the pandemic um, affect your ability to deal with this, this train derailment crisis? I, I guess I'll, I'll start with that if you want, uh, Dr. The, the, certainly the COVID response helped prepare us for this. The relationships that we had, the, the staff, the, the, the can-do attitude of our staff and our team, the relationships we have that are really strong with our neighbors, our community partners, I think that was all born out of the, the COVID experience. Um, and so that helped prepare us. But as we talk about uh, when you gear up for a response, there's a lot of intensity and energy. Um, and maybe I'm st stealing Laura's piece here because we talk about this. When you have a response via COVID or a train derailment or a final exam, right, you gear up for that. And then after the event, there's this letdown piece that you're really not prepared for. And it happens and it's, it happens to everybody in a little different way where you try to get back to normal, but you almost can't uh, because you have to work through that whole process. Again, maybe that's stress, uh, that's stress management or stress related, but the, the gear up is actually the easier part for people like myself. And I think we bore that out of COVID uh, response. We geared up very quickly for vaccinations and response in, in lots of different ways, but it was the, we were coming down off of that mountain during, from COVID and we went right into the derailment. Um, and so it was like it started all back up again. Uh, we've essentially been at DEF CON 5 for four years. So it's, it's tough. Laura. Laura Gretchen, would you like to? I, I definitely would say it made, the, our experience with COVID made this situation a lot easier to work together very quickly. Um, Wes often will say, be a good neighbor. Um, and what we found out through COVID was the health department was our good neighbor. When we became overwhelmed with the patients from the county prison, they stepped in immediately and created this system so that that burden was lessened. We saw that when they needed help at the jail, we needed to go out there and we needed to test and then we needed to vaccinate and, and the same thing with the drive-through clinics. So it became routine for us to say that this collaboration is there and it's in place. So when they called to say, can you help us? It was our turn to be that good neighbor and provide that physician. I think had things been different, we hadn't already experienced that from you know, 2020 through 23. It, not that the leadership team would not have said that they wanted to help. They probably still would have helped, but it was, it was of course we're gonna help because this is what we've done for each other. Uh, everything Wes said. Uh, plus, I will add that going through COVID, I think that we uh, we got stronger uh, as a department, um, and we we did a great job in COVID. Not to toot our own horn, but we built a giant building. We were vaccinating six, eight, eight, I don't know, a bunch of cars at a time. It was it was people coming from other states to get vaccines in Columbia County. It was crazy. So our staff uh, felt empowered that they, they they can do this, right? So the train derailed, and once we got our head wrapped around that. Like we, we got this, maybe we need some help, but we have this and we have a leader that knows how to handle things and, and that's what we needed. So that's all of the success. Um, Gretchen said something about, you know, when the, when the accident first happened, that there was misinformation and mistrust. Um, do you think that, the, that your response to COVID um, increased your level of trust and communication with the community? And it, maybe in what way? How did, how did that impact? I, I think um, we became, because during COVID, we were reasonable, we were accessible, we would talk to people, we tried to help our community. Uh, and I think when they got in another crisis, they reached to us, right? Who else are they gonna, are they gonna call, you know, the company, the corporate, no. Are they gonna, you know, in our community, the, the trust of the state and the federal government, the people they don't know, or are they gonna trust people that they've talked to on the phone already, that maybe they went to high school with, or, you know, they were in their wedding or, right, they knew us. They would read about us on, in the paper and we did a lot of, uh, you know, forums and trainings with all of our community partners. So somebody knew somebody. It's a, it's a small community. We're still um, old school. Uh, we still all know each other. We still, you know, interact with each other. It's still a very small town feeling. And so when someone needs help, they call. And so they would call us because we were, that was our responsibility. 
I think also the transparency that was displayed during COVID to the community helped to gain that trust during the time of the derailment. I think we expanded our brand during COVID. People know the health department as food inspector, most of the time maybe a vaccine, but um, running our social media, we've got a bunch of more followers during COVID and so perfect. Now they know where our website is and they, now they know where to get information for the train. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, um, a year later, what are your challenges? What are the biggest challenges that you face today? Uh, fill in the ranks. Um, you know, a lot of our partners that respond, uh, this is on the private and the, the, the federal or even the state, maybe not so much the state level, but the federal level, they have the ability to bring experts in that focus on that task and that job, and then they rotate out six months later or six weeks later or two weeks later. They rotate out and they're gone, and a new person comes in and fills that slot. There's nobody to backfill us except each other. Um, we don't have another environmental director to handle the food crisis or the, uh, the pool closure or the, you know, it, the environmental division is, is just Laura. I know at the hospital, this is just one more piece for, for Dr. Nickel that she has to manage this piece as well. So I, I think that's the ongoing challenge is to, to maintain operational status in our day-to-day -day work and still dedicate so much focused energy in this response um, because this is important too. There's lots of important things that we're doing right now. Uh, and I think time management and self-care are, are always a challenge every day, every week. Which is difficult to do when you're one person deep at each right. task, right? That's right. Yeah, for me, from the medical standpoint, it's continuing to get that information out to the public that the clinic is there, the clinic is available, that we have this ongoing health surveillance available to them. and making sure they know that it is free of charge and that we are there and the plan is to stay there for this yearly testing for anybody that wants it. Similar in the water sampling program, we don't really know what the ongoing sampling is going to look like. Uh, we intend to and want to continue sampling, but residents might be concerned that that program is going to stop, stop and we want to tell them that we're, we're not going anywhere, we're here, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that you feel comfortable drinking your water. So, so moving forward, what are your biggest concerns? I mean, you've articulated some of them already, but like, what are you worried about in the future? I, I, I would say funding, obviously funding, right? Um, Dr. Vince, can you, can you use the Dr. Uh, Nickel approach with the... <laughs> Sure. There we go. Better? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I think uh, the ongoing is certainly funding, right? There's certain things that we want to do. Uh, we want to monitor health. We want to monitor uh, the groundwater. And I think going forward, you have to, you can want to do all the greatest things in public health, but if you don't have any funding, forget it. Um, and so, you know, the funding piece I think is really important um, going forward. I, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, though, if this has changed our community, recovery for East Palestine is in the future. Uh, and, and that's an ongoing process. So I think that's gonna always be a concern. And, and you talked about the train whistle. Ho hopefully one day we can get past that so it doesn't, it doesn't bring those feelings back to our community. Um, so I think that's an ongoing challenge. I think there are several challenges. I, I'll just focus on my own um, standpoint from a medical standpoint being funding again. The clinic is there. Um, we have everything in place, but it is still, even a year later, a situation where all the details of it are being worked out. So uh, while I am certain the funding will be there to keep the clinic going for whatever that time frame needs to be, we don't yet know where the funding is going to come from. So the uncertainty of it does bring additional concerns even a year later. Um, so. Is there anything that, in, in hindsight, you would do differently in, in response to this? I know you were kind of constructing the car as you're getting into it and driving it, which is a difficult thing to do, right? So with that hindsight, with that, with that knowledge of what you know now, what would you do at the beginning? My, my thought on that, again, knowing now what we know, is if we'd only known a permanent clinic was going to be necessary, I would have rather created something 
as quickly as possible to truly provide the full gamut of primary care rather than just an assessment clinic. It was great for the, the time of what we needed. But again, looking back on it, we realized just within a few weeks that this needs to be permanent. It would have been, in hindsight, great to be able to draw labs on people, treat people right then and there, rather than having to refer them out to their primary care or specialty physician for treatment that they might need. Um, of course, now we can say that because the clinic's in place, but it, it would have taken still some time to get that going. But ideally, medically, I think it would have eased some minds if we were able to do certain things like chest x-rays and basic lab work and some basic treatment when needed. I would probably add that um, what we would like to have done different is if we had uh, a mechanism or had established some regional support uh, regarding public information, maybe, and some of that response support, maybe some leadership support so that we could, you know, bring someone in, maybe some kind of regional system. I know uh, uh, Ben Robinson and I have talked about some of this regional support, right, to bring in what do we have for public information experts while our field staff are doing their thing. Well, we, we can rotate out with someone else that, that gets us, that, that understands our community, understands our role in public health, uh, maybe even some leadership or some um, other administrative support that we could maybe bring in on a temporary basis to allow a mechanism for the locals to be able to rotate out, right, so that we can get a downtime. So you can maybe attend a, a kindergarten birthday party or something simple like that that's very meaningful to other parts of life as well. Um, so I think a, a mechanism like that, that would be something that I would have liked to have established more formal, I think. Is, is there an association for county public health departments? Y yes, we have uh, several, actually. There's the Ohio Environmental Health Association, the Association of Ohio Health Commissioners. Um, we certainly have a lot of relationships uh, beyond that. Nationally, we have NACHO, um, ASTO. I mean, there are lots of organizations, and, and this is something that we're learning. Uh, as we come through COVID, we come through train derailments, we come through other community emergencies, that maybe these are some pieces that we need to be looking at, not just at the local level and say, oh, we need more ICS training or more public information training, but we need to build capacity. And so how do you do that on a limited budget? How do you build capacity so that it can move around to some of our other partners? You know, how can, how can we now provide support to maybe another community across the state that maybe needs help for a week or two? You know, we're willing to do that. How do we do it? What, what structure, what format do we do that in? I think uh, Wes has said communication several times, and I think we did a great job communicating, but I can't help but think that if we would have done more, maybe some of the misinformation um, would have got quelled beforehand. So uh, really pushing the communication, maybe when you feel like you, people are sick of hearing it, continue to tell them. Um, I think mm -hmm. that might have helped a little bit. Maybe, the, maybe those uh, associations would be a vehicle for establishing more of a, a regional network of actors. Yeah, that's where that conversation, I think, is, is getting some traction now. So we're, we're very thankful. And again, it's something that maybe bore out of this, uh, as well as COVID and other community emergencies. OK, I think we'll, um, we'll stop there. But we want to allow time for questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? I will bring the microphone around, and we'll be happy to uh, spend the next couple minutes with a few questions for the panel. Yep, up front, Alex, of course, public health major, student award winner, amazing, you know, hair, yep. all around good guy. Yes, you can send us your resume. <laughs> we can do that. We can do that. So my question is, Dr. Walsh made note of the train tracks back there. My apartment is genuinely 400 feet behind there. So I think about what, you know, have other county health departments or state national actors, whoever, have they been in touch with you to, I mean, you were talking about how this, you're adding this to your emergency, emergency preparedness kind of, you know, playbooks and things like that. Have, are you being drawn on as a resource? Yes. Like recently, right now, for the future, like what's that look like? Yes, I think this has been an opportunity for a lot of our local partners across the country 
not just Ohio, across the country, have looked at this and said, well, we need to consider this as a potential outcome and what are we prepared to do? What are, who are our partners? How would we respond? Um, and we get questions like that and part of the reason why we're glad to do these, these kinds of presentations to, so that people ask those questions so they think about that um, and they can call us. Uh, so we're certainly available to the, to the industry, the community at large, the public health world, uh, as well as our own community. So yes, that's happening and we're very thankful for that. Thanks, Alex. Other questions? Have a couple more minutes. Don't be shy. We're a community of learners. All right. This one's for you, Wes. Commissioner Robeson. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the presentation. Let me say first, before I ask my question, uh, you represented public health so well and stepped into a situation that would have been overwhelming for anyone in your shoes. And so just want to say thank you on behalf of, of public health and behalf of your community for all that you did. Thank you, thank you. Couldn't have done it without the partnerships and, and a great team. Uh, I just want to ask a question and unpack something that you covered in your presentation. You mentioned just how valuable it was to understand the right role at the right time. If you could talk just a little bit more about how being ready to understand uh, the first responder uh, response in the beginning that positioned you to get ready for your role and how that set you up for success as you turn the corner into some of the longer term roles. Thanks. It, yeah, gr great question. Um, in, in any of these sorts of responses, we need to let our first responders do first responder things. They're, they're great at what they do. They're trained in their, their, uh, their role and we certainly didn't want to interfere with put out the fire, uh, keep people safe, evacuate people, get them away from danger, right? I mean, that's, that's first and foremost. But you, don't, you can't sit there and just watch the fire burn. You have, to, you have to be planning and thinking and talking with your team and your, your community partners and say, okay, what, what's our role? What are we gonna be expected to do? What's our concerns? Right, so health is a concern, and, and groundwater, huge concern in our community. We had just come off of, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years of oil and gas drilling, um, and a lot of concern about groundwater. Right, um, our community is, is supplied by mostly uh, individual residential wells, and so this is a very important piece. Clean water is very important to our community, uh, and so we knew that was going to be a focus. That's in our lane. There were things that aren't in our lane. We don't monitor streams. That's really not our role. That's Ohio EPA. You know, we don't really monitor or, or handle soil remediation. That's not our thing. So we're gonna focus on the things that were in our lane and how do we best prepare to respond to those, uh, those pieces. And, and quite honestly, having dialogue with, with our team and some of our other partners, again, Ohio Department of Health, some of our, uh, our federal uh, partners from, Ohio, uh, from EPA, um, ATSDR, CDC, these were all people that were helping us with that thought process. Uh, they had seen so many different things. Laura, Dr. Nickel, anything additional? Question. Great, thank you. Um, we are at two o'clock. I'm gonna stop it there. I appreciate everyone being here. On behalf of BGSU, thank you very much for attending. Let's give one more round of applause for our professionals. There are numerous lunch boxes back here. We have paid for all of this. There should be zero lunch boxes back here by the time everyone has left. Please stop at the back and grab a box lunch and some sides and some brownies. For uh, nursing, here's your disclosures. No financial conflicts of interest. And there's your QR code for the evaluation. You must complete the evaluation to get your CEUs. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next year at April 3rd, 2025. Yeah.